StarCast 5, July 29th to 31st in Nashville, gearing up to be a huge event you don't want to miss. Amazing stage shows and live wrestling with shows from Black Label Pro, GCW, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and of course, Ric Flair's Last Match, which has an amazing lineup of talent from all over the wrestling landscape. Headlined by Ric Flair's Last Match, and you can follow the story leading up to the match over at Ric Flair's Last Match. Com. We've got new episodes Mondays at 6.05 Eastern. For tickets and more information, go to StarCast.com. So the show opened up. Hey, did you hear about Titus O'Neil? Oh, my God. Yeah, I love Titus O'Neil, but, man, this poor guy had to come out and talk uh, about WWE and how they needed goodwill more than ever now. A it was their space. job to put smiles on faces. They'd never talk about politics or religion, God, except when there's an important yeah. angle that involves politics or religion. Remember when God wrestled? Maybe it was a different. Yeah. Maybe it was a non-religious god I was unaware of, but anyway, he welcomed everybody to Raw, and that was that was quite the uh, that was quite the segment. Then we had Becky coming down to the ring. You know, what's so funny about this. I, I don't even care. Remember they had that poll. It's like who has better storytelling, uh, WWE or AEW? Well, the story is that Becky lost a hundred matches in a row. Okay. And she was d- d- just done to the bottom of the barrel. She won one match, and now she's headlining SummerSlam against the winner of Bianca and Carmella. So anyway, they have the match. Uh, there was an argument and everything beforehand, but it wasn't all that exciting. So they have the match. Uh, they go 10 minutes. It's not very good. And then finally, Carmella slaps Bianca, and Bianca's like, oh, yeah? And she gets mad, grabs her, hits her move, and pins her. <laughs> it's like, well, what do we waste 10 minutes for if it's that easy? All you had to do was get mad and hit your move. So she did, and now it is Bianca versus Becky coming up at SummerSlam. We had Angelo Dawkins and Street Profits, Montez, all excited about Jeff Jarrett, and MVP and Omos show up. MVP makes fun of Dawkins for losing to Omos last week, and he wants him to do a singles match later on tonight, which unfortunately was accepted. We had the KO show, and... uh, (laughs) This is more great storytelling. So Kevin Owens is out there. He introduces a riddle. He says, you're a laid-back sort of fella. And he goes, you know, you uh, you lost your best friend, Randy. And I lost my best friend, Seth Rollins. He said horrible things about me. For those of you who forget, Seth called him fat. He Actually, there was another part of it, but and Kevin got very upset about that. They're not friends anymore. So Kevin said, you know what would be cool is you lost your friend, I lost mine. Why don't we team up together? Bro, KO for Kevin Owens. Bro, KO. And Matt Riddle says, listen, I don't trust you. And so Kevin Owens says, right, rightly, dude, you teamed up with Randy Orton. Nobody in the history of WWE has turned on, which is a lie, by the way, because it's a big show, but no one has turned on more people. No one is less trustworthy than Randy Orton. Now, this is a true statement, okay? He's had 20 years of screwing people over, but this makes Riddle angry. And so Riddle gets really mad, and then Seth flies in and blindsides, blindsides him and gives him a stump. So I don't know if Owens and Seth are friends again. That was not made clear because Kevin Owens just vanished. But uh, that's going to lead to SummerSlam. Well, and then, Brian, that is subjective. That is subjective. If you are Matt Riddle, you are saying to yourself, no, Randy has not turned on me, Kevin Owens. Meanwhile, you are sitting here begging for a friend. I've got a friend, and his name is Randy. So that is not true that Kevin Owens is less trustworthy or, or, or more trustworthy than Randy Orton is. We're talking about history, dude. In the history of this business, Randy Orton has turned on more people than Kevin Owens because he's been around for 20 years. He's had more people to turn on. It's math. So then Rollins is getting interviewed, and Ezekiel is angry at him for beating up Riddle. So Ezekiel shows up. They argue back and forth. This also leads to a match. Judgment Day, they vow that Dominic will join Judgment Day tonight. This leads to Damian Priest versus Rey Mysterio. One week before Rey's 20th anniversary celebration on Raw, he goes in there, a five-minute match, he gets beat clean in the middle. So then they start beating him up afterwards. They're going to give him the concerto. They say, Dominic, if you don't get in here, if you don't join the Judgment Day right now, we're going we're gonna to take out your dad. So Dominic agrees to join. But then, after he agrees to join, they say, it don't work like that. 
and they start beating him up. And then they go to give the concerto, but Ray flees. So they're teasing that next week it's Ray and Dominic versus Judgment Day. And Judgment Day says they're going to finish. They said they're going to finish off the Mysterios once and for all. Which, when you think about it, you know where this is going. Dominic is joining. And thus they will finish off the Mysterios once and for all. They're all chumps. Everybody involved in this is a chump. And yeah, that's the direction I guess that they're going ahead with. But like, Dominic's a chump. Ray's a chump. Damian Priest, who just self destructed after having the, what, Intercontinental title for how long without being beat, he's a chump. Finn Balor lost himself into this position by being embarrassed and flopping around like a fish and then falling off the ropes and then losing to Edge. And then all of a sudden, now he replaces Edge. And come on. The only good, smart person in any of this right now is, uh, what's her name? Because she's out and hurt and whatever it is, getting her face fixed. Rhea. Rhea Ripley. That's yeah, the only heart person that's benefiting from any of this right now because she's not there. Is Damian Priest any better off than where he was before? And Damian Priest, a guy who's got years on him, a guy who looks good in a suit and is tall and had everything going for him, now this is where you're at because this is going Bro. to make him a better WWE superstar. Come on. Bro, he could be in maximum male models. So I would say he's doing just fine right now with Finn Balor. And next week with Young Dom. Then the Rated R Superstar can return. Team with Rey Mysterio. You got tag matches. There's a lot worse things that could happen. He could be in maximum male models. Yeah. He could be. He's doing better now than if he were doing the summer collection this coming Friday. Trust me. Seth Rollins faced Ezekiel. It was, uh, it honestly wasn't all that good. It was all right. Curb stomp finish was not the worst thing on the show because that was coming up later. We have uh, a bunch of other stuff. Angelo Dawkins and Omos. They have a horrible match. It goes a minute 20. And then uh, first uh, Montez Ford tried to trip Omos. Then MVP tripped Dawkins. And the ref saw him and called for the disqualification. So Dawkins beats Omos via DQ. The fans groaned, loud groans, like, my God. So then Adam Pierce comes out. And you know what he says? He goes, I think the fans here want to see the Street Profits versus MVP and Omas. I don't think he was right, but that's what he said. Then he goes, don't say we don't give you what you want. And he signs the match. I was like, wow, that was quite the line. Don't say we don't give you what we what you want. We're going to give you this match. So they give us this match, the Street Profits versus Omos and MVP in a full three-piece suit. <laughs> You'll never guess the finish. Montez Ford, who is challenging for the World Tag Team titles at SummerSlam, hits the biggest frog splash you've ever seen on Omos, and Omos kicks out at one so we have to f- do the close-up of Ford for about five minutes, showing his shocked face. And then finally, he decides to go up and try again. Because if at first you don't succeed, he goes up top and he gets attacked by the Usos for the DQ. So they did a DQ to set up a second match that went to a DQ. So then... Hey, guys, like this theory... Well, if you do, have I got the show for you? Theory comes out, and he talks, and he talks, and he talks, and he talks, and he talks. And the fans go, what? 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 So he got heat, but it's a bunch of what chants. So this brings out AJ. He makes fun of AJ for being old. And, of course, he's young. And this leads to a match. And, uh, you know, listen. Bro, this guy, dude. They want this guy to be their next John Cena, okay? Fine. You're pushing him to the moon. You're giving him a lot of talking time. But, brother, when he gets in that ring, he's got to be able to do something. You know one of the reasons that fans turned on John Cena 
when he got that spot in 2005. You want to know one of the reasons they turned on that guy? Well, they turned on him because you had the SmackDown 6 and your Jerichos and your Eddies and your Benoits and all these great workers, and they, they pushed John Cena to the top who wasn't a very good worker. Well, bro, this theory goes in there. It has the most boring match. He had the most boring match on Friday with Madcap Moss, who's a great athlete. And he had an equally boring match here with uh, AJ. You know how hard it is to have a boring match with AJ Styles? Dude, he gets the heat and he puts him in a chin lock. And it's a chin lock. And it's a chin lock. And AJ escapes and he puts him back in a chin lock. And a chin lock. AJ escapes, he takes him down, puts him in an arm bar, and he holds the arm bar. I'm like, dude, yeah, this worked great for Baron Corbin. When he was going in there having boring matches every week because he thought it was a great way to get heat. Well, now, you know, it turned out fans decided he was boring, and then he wasn't a main eventer anymore. So, dude, you got to let this guy do some stuff. These matches are killing me. And then they go to a count out. A count out. After Ziggler super kicks him outside. I'm losing it. Asuka, Alexa, and Dana versus Tamina, Dewdrop, and Nikki Ash. Dave argued this. Maybe he's right, but I don't believe it. They said that the 24-7 rule is waived when the champions are having a match. Well, 24-7 champions in the match. Tozawa runs in. Tozawa pins Dana. Nikki pins Tozawa. Bliss pins Nikki. Dewdrop pins Bliss. Tamina pins Dewdrop. Brooke pins Tamina. Brooke then runs away from a six man. And then Oscar gets the win. Two minutes and 35 seconds for seven title changes. Then we finally have the main event Miz TV with Logan Paul. You guys like Logan Paul? Well, no one else does. He's booed unmercifully. They boo. They boo him. They cheer the Miz. He's trying so hard to be a babyface. He fails the entire time. Finally, he gets his one line in that Miz has tiny balls. He gets a tiny balls chant. Miz ends up attacking him. He beats him up. Ciampa tries to attack him. He clears the ring of both guys. Bales still can't get cheered. Back in a moment, Observer Live. This was the best thing on the show, and uh, the show was all downhill from there. So uh, I guess I can continue on. To uh, Dana Brooke beat Becky Lynch. Did I really see this? And that, my friends, is Monday Night Raw. If you enjoy these videos, for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full-length editions of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, The Mad Men Podcast, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo and more, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.